Good morning and welcome to our briefing on Cornwall ahead of the G7 in June. My name's Glenn Kaplan Gray. I'm the Chief Exec of the Cornwall and Arsacilli Local Enterprise Partnership, which is the private sector led economic development body for our region. During the course of today, you'll hear from a number of people about the sectors and the projects that they're working on, which hopefully will put Cornwall in context before you arrive. Our team will be in the comments bar, so if you've got any questions, please put them in and we'll come back to you during the course of this briefing or, or shortly afterwards. One of the reasons that Cornwall is hosting the G7 is because we're playing a leading role in the transition to a low carbon economy. We were one of the first regions in the UK to declare a climate emergency and our target for becoming carbon neutral is 2030, a full 20 years ahead of the UK's target. Part of our story and part of the reason we think we can achieve that target is because the natural environment means we're a perfect place to transition to renewable energies. You'll hear today about floating offshore wind and our aspirations to be a world leader in that sector. You'll also hear about geo-resources, not only mining for rare earth metals such as lithium, which are key to the transition to electric vehicles and a low carbon economy, but also about geothermal and the commercial production of heat uh, as well as electricity from the energy that's under our feet here in Cornwall. You'll also hear from people directly involved in globally significant changes to the Cornish economy and things that are creating the momentum for our business leaders to have confidence in the future. Particularly, you'll hear about space sector. You'll hear from uh, Melissa Thorpe from Spaceport Cornwall and also her colleagues at Goon Hilly who are at the forefront of not only launch uh, in terms of satellites, but what we do with the data that they gather and beam back to the UK and to the world. Tamsin Smith will be talking to you about the creative industries and the way that they're merging not only with our cultural sector, but with our digital sector. Cornwall was, as a result of 20 years rollout of superfast broadband, is one of the most connected places in the world, particularly in a rural context. And we're using that connectivity to beam content, product all over the world. So hopefully when you get here, you'll have seen some of the uh, world-class companies that are choosing to locate in Cornwall, but export product all over the world. Cornwall's home to 570,000 people and 24,000 businesses. Most of those are small businesses, and most of them are in sectors such as agriculture and tourism. Partly that's why the transition to a low carbon economy is really important. We want to capture the opportunity, the supply chains, of not only making a difference to the environment, but making a difference to our business environment as well. We want to be a global leader where low carbon is as important as growth and we're redefining sustainability in an economic development sense. So over the course of this briefing, you'll be hearing from a number of people making change happen right now in Cornwall. First on our list is Lucy Crane, who is senior geologist at Cornish Lithium, leading the charge for the search for tech metals here in Cornwall. The energy transition is materials intensive. There is four times more copper in electric vehicles and will need about 500 times more lithium in the next 20 years. Cornwall still has world-class deposits and with prices increasing, it is worthwhile exploring. From tin and tungsten, historically mined throughout Cornwall, to the new and innovative work being done to extract lithium from granite mica and brines, Cornwall's geology creates a real opportunity for us to support the energy transition. So Cornwall's geo-resources have always played, you know, a really big part in the economy here. Tin and copper mining historically, and actually now there's the potential to produce minerals such as lithium, which is so key to the energy transition, as well as renewable energies such as geothermal from the ground beneath our feet. So Cornish Lithium are looking to produce lithium from two different scenarios. One is from hard rock, so from the granite itself. And then secondly, we're looking at producing lithium from the geothermal waters in Cornwall and we want to produce these minerals that are going to enable the energy transition as responsibly as we possibly can. And to do that, it means embracing new technologies. In 2018, British Lithium was the first company to explore for lithium. We've drilled up over 100 million tonnes of lithium mica granite, which is enough to produce 21,000 tonnes of carbonate. That should support one third of the UK's requirements should we switch to EVs. Most of the world's lithium production comes from spodumene. Unfortunately, we don't have spodumene in the UK. We have a lithium mica granite, which requires bespoke 
novel processing. Since 2016, British Lithium have been developing our LCEP technology, which is sustainable, carbon-free, and produces battery-grade lithium carbonate. The opportunity for tech metal mining in Cornwall is really significant. At South Crofty, we're primarily focused on tin. Tin is the forgotten foot soldier of the high-tech world. It's used in absolutely everything that we need for our modern lives. Mobile phones, robotics, computing, power generation, power storage, everything that we need for a low carbon economy requires tin. What makes South Crofty a world-class mine is, is the high-grade nature of the ore. We have to mine less material to produce the same amount of tin. Hi, my name's Lucy Crane and I'm a senior geologist with Cornish Lithium. So Cornwall's got this amazing natural capital. That's why we've got the potential for floating offshore wind, it's why we've got the blue and the green economies, but we've also got amazing geo-resources here. So tin and copper have been mined for four, five thousand years in Cornwall and actually we haven't run out of minerals here. Rather, mining stopped when the last tin mine closed in 1998, South Crofty, because the tin price crashed and actually it was a lot cheaper to produce it in other parts of the world. I think when the tin price crashed it was about three and a half thousand dollars a tonne. Um, as I'm talking today it's nearer to thirty five thousand dollars a tonne. We've got huge mineral potential down here in Cornwall and there's the opportunity for it to really boost the UK economy. The energy transition to allow us to combat climate change and move away from our reliance on fossil fuels is going to be really mineral intensive. To put this into context, the World Bank estimate that over the last 5,000 years, humanity has mined about 550 million tonnes of copper. They reckon that we need that same amount of copper over the next 25 years, purely for use in low carbon technologies, such as wind turbines, electric vehicles and solar panels. This means that the mining industry has got a huge job in front of us. We need to look in parts of the world that are more remote. Uh, we need to look deeper undercover. We need to utilise new technologies that actually allow us to extract materials from ore that maybe in the past has been thought of as unconventional or too low grade. But it also means that we need to take a fresh look at the mineral resources that we've got on our doorstep. An onshore wind plant requires nine times more mineral resources than a gas-fired power plant to generate the same amount of energy. And an electric vehicle is six times as mineral intensive as producing a conventional car. So these low carbon technologies are going to require us to mine a whole suite of materials, not just tin and copper, but also things such as lithium. And currently, the UK is totally reliant on imports of all of these raw materials. Yet we've got huge potential down here in the southwest to produce things such as lithium, tin, copper, and even tungsten. We've just seen in the Geo Resources video now a taster of the potential that the Southwest actually has to produce some of these critical raw materials. And there could be huge benefits for the UK if we can actually bring these mineral exploration projects into production. Currently, we're totally reliant on imports of lithium, for example. Um, and actually, if we can produce these things closer to home, then there are numerous benefits. There's, you know, this kind of security of supply that we can start to think about. If we have oversight of the whole supply chain, we can build vertically integrated supply chains here in the UK for things such as lithium. If we can produce the lithium here, refine it into battery quality lithium in the UK and actually produce lithium ion batteries that go into electric vehicles here, then not only have we got that security of supply, but we've also got you know, oversight of that whole supply chain. We can ensure that things are being produced responsibly to the highest environmental standards, and that workers are being paid fairly. And with some of these global supply chains at the moment, you can't necessarily guarantee that. In light of things such as the Brexit rules of origin as well, the UK car industry is so important to the UK economy. And actually producing electric vehicles in the UK to you know, maintain our market share and be able to sell to Europe is going to involve us also building batteries here. And if we're building those batteries, it just seems to make sense to produce the primary materials here as well if we've got the geological potential to. And the work that Cornish Lithium and others are doing is kind of proving that we seem to have a significant amount of these raw materials here. 
So the work that companies such as Cornish Lithium are doing down here in the southwest is really proving the geological potential that the UK has to provide some of these critical raw materials for the UK itself. If we delve into the work that we're doing here at Cornish Lithium in a bit more detail, I think we're a fantastic example of how embracing new technologies and actually looking with fresh eyes at somewhere such as Cornwall is just revealing what potential there actually is under the ground here. So we have a test facility at United Downs in central Cornwall where we've drilled our first exploration holes back in 2020 and we're currently trialling a number of these direct lithium extraction technologies to see which one's actually most suitable for Cornwall. So the work that Cornish Lithium and all the other companies that you saw in the Geo Resources video are doing is really proving quite how significant the resources of these critical raw materials could be here in the UK. By embracing new technologies to allow us explore, to explore for things responsibly, to extract things efficiently and in a low carbon manner, there really is a huge opportunity for the UK to provide some of the critical raw materials that are going to be so crucial to our energy transition and our green future here in the UK. Hi, my name is Hazel Farndale and I am the project geologist for Geothermal Engineering Limited, the developers and operators of the United Downs Deep Geothermal Project near Redruth in Cornwall. Uh, so geothermal energy literally means using the heat from deep within the earth to uh, generate electricity or just directly for heating. So at United Downs, we are the first geothermal power site in the UK. So we act as a really key demonstration of this technology. So in Cornwall, we have this incredible geothermal resource. So we sit above a very large granite body that stretches all the way from Dartmoor in Devon, throughout Cornwall to Land's End and out to the Isles of Scilly. Now this granite is naturally heat producing. So it contains these isotopes of things like uranium and potassium and thorium, which naturally decay through time. And this process of decay releases heat. So this heat is really what we're targeting through our geothermal development. But not only this actually, there are fracture zones, really, really large fractures throughout Cornwall uh, that penetrate really deep into this granite. And that allows fluid deep within the earth to, to move around and to, to spread out and create reservoirs at depth. Now this fluid flow is just as important as the heat as it allows us to gather the, the heat from depth and bring it to the surface. And that's how we can harness the energy. So geothermal power works through very simply through sort of two boreholes or two very deep wells. So um, at our system at United Downs, we have an injection well uh, into which uh, fluid at the surface will be pumped down into the granite. Uh, it will then percolate throughout the granite and, and heat up. And then through the second well, we have what was called the production well and the water will flow up to the surface. And that is where we can then generate the heat and power. Now at our site, we have what is called a binary power plant. So this means that the fluid at depth actually remains within a closed loop. And this means that we have to have a secondary working fluid at the surface, which has a lower boiling temperature. Now this fluid will be heated by the geothermal fluid and will uh, flash to steam at a lower temperature. And that is what will turn the turbines and ultimately generate electricity. So geothermal energy has a huge number of benefits, um, as with a lot of renewable energy technologies. But the key ones that we like to say are that uh, it is a baseload power. So that means that it runs 24 seven for up to 365 days a year. Um, so that's really amazing. And it is not even dependent on the weather or the time of day. Um, beyond this, uh, it is a, um, it has the smallest surface footprint of any renewable energy technology. And not only this, it also has uh, releases to at least 10 times less carbon emissions than the current UK grid. Um, but beyond uh, these benefits of geothermal electricity, we also have renewable heat. Now this heat is, is a byproduct of the electricity generation, uh, but it will enable us to, um, to provide opportunities for really heat intensive businesses. And that in turn brings a lot of green job opportunities as well. So at our site at United Downs, uh, we've had some really exciting developments. Um, so in 2019, we drilled our two wells. We have UD2, which is the injection well, and that was drilled to 2,393 meters. Uh, we then have our second well, uh, UD1, which is our production well. And this was drilled down to 5,275 meters. And this is actually the deepest onshore well in the UK. 
so it's this really great depth that gives us such amazing temperatures because we reach about 180 degrees Celsius down there. So uh, since drilling, we've also had a number of key milestones. So for instance, in January in 2021, we actually signed the first power purchase agreement uh, for geothermal electricity with a company called Ecotricity. And this power purchase agreement or PPA enables us to sell three megawatts of electricity to the UK grid. And this is enough to heat and power 10,000 homes. Beyond this, we will also be able to provide direct heat to local businesses and local houses. Um, now, direct heat can be used uh, for anything that requires heat, whether that's heating commercial greenhouses or uh, for large industrial units for heating or cooling them, um, or even for uh, helping mature rum in large casks uh, in a, a tropical environment. So there's a really huge range of opportunities. And this also brings with it a huge number of green jobs that could be created alongside. So geothermal energy actually has a really bright and exciting future here in the UK. So not only do we have the United Dam site as a great demonstration, we also have Eden Geothermal who have started drilling at their site in, in May this year. And we have the Jubilee Pool who are uh, a geothermally heated uh, swimming pool in Penzance and they're already enjoying this incredible resource. Um, so not only do we have this, um, this potential in Cornwall, but we will also be hoping to, to spread it out to the whole U of the UK um, where there is also amazing potential. So the Renewable Energy Association, the REA, uh, re recently released a report uh, that suggested that the UK as a whole has a geothermal potential of 222 gigawatts of electricity. Now this is actually enough to, to power the UK six times over annually um, and is a, a really incredible resource that uh, cannot be overlooked anymore. Um, so not only do we have this real exciting opportunity to help reach net zero emissions for the UK, but we also have this awesome opportunity to get some green jobs and help ourselves have a green uh, recovery to our economy. Cornwall is well positioned to generate clean energy resources with deep waters and winds, facilitating the development of floating offshore wind and hot rocks enabling geothermal, as well as the skills and technology from existing marine and mining sectors. With pioneering and innovative people, Cornwall is intent on creating the clean energy resources to meet our own zero carbon targets and export our resources to help others meet theirs. We came across a problem in the storage and transportation of methane. Um, realised that we could use the methane, because it is a fuel, ultimately it's a global warming gas, but it is a fuel, um, to cool itself. Once you can transport it and store it safely at low pressure, you can make fuel tanks that fit onto any vehicle, use and you know, replace diesel, petrol, propane. And you know, the fact that we're, we're, we're capturing a gas which is actually really polluting, turning it into a fuel, it gives us a negative carbon footprint. So Cornwall has some really incredible geology. We have granite under a lot of our feet and this granite is naturally heat producing. And beyond this, it's also a lot of it is naturally fractured. And these fractures allow water to move through the rock. And it's this movement of water that allows us to harness the heat from great depth up at the surface. So our deepest well is about 5.2 kilometres deep. And it's from this that we will be uh, harnessing the deep water and we're bringing it to the surface at about 180 degrees. Um, at this temperature, we're able to produce electricity. This is the first phase of a two-phase project. So at the moment, we're just drilling one well, four and a half kilometres down, to see what's there, see how hot it is, and see whether we can get permeability and some water. Then the second phase, assuming that goes well, will be to drill a second well and set up a circulation between them. And once we've done that, the whole of the Eden project will be better than carbon neutral and that we'll be supplying enough electricity for about 7,000 houses. Cornwall's almost a perfect location for floating offshore wind. Uh, we've got the depth of water offshore, which is one of the only two locations in the country where you can do that. Mm. The opportunities, if we're successful, are huge. Our aim is to get three gigawatts of floating offshore wind installed by 2030, and that would require 10 billion pounds of inward investment uh, and would create at least 3,500 jobs. It would also position us perfectly to be a world leader in floating offshore and an export around the world. So for us it means a large body of work, um, working to design the first systems and to industrialise uh, floating offshore wind, which really is a new application of some very much tried and tested technologies, especially in the Cornish waters.
My name's Matt Hodson and I'm here to talk about the opportunity that floating offshore wind presents Cornwall. Floating offshore wind is probably one of the globe's biggest renewable opportunities facing us as we, as we um, approach an era of climate change mitigation. We can't move to a low carbon future unless we really think about large scale green power generation solutions. Offshore wind has proven itself to be one of the big contributors to that change due to the scale and the cost reduction that we've seen over the last five years. But globally, fixed offshore wind can't be the answer due to the depth of water you find uh, uh, along the margins of many coastal regions. If we think about the markets of California, the west coast of the USA, Japan, Korea, these are all regions with a big need for green power and offshore wind, but the water is far too deep for fixed wind to work economically. So floating offshore wind is the answer. Now floating offshore wind is at a stage where it is technology proven. There are 30 megawatt installations in Scotland, in France, and they are under development here in the Celtic Sea. Floating offshore wind farms uh, consist of floating platforms um, with offshore wind turbines installed. They're pretty big. Um, potentially they could be 220 metres to the highest tip height, if not taller, looking at the way technology is developing. And the platforms can be 60 to 90 metres across and weigh 10,000 tonnes. So this is not insignificant um, equipment. Um, quite exciting, really. It's more to the seabed in depths of water of between 60 to 200 metres uh, and they're towed from assembly ports by towage vessels. I suppose the difference between floating offshore wind and fixed wind is that it's further offshore, it's much further offshore in fact, where um, we've seen um, fixed offshore wind farms in the North Sea, certainly those that people may be familiar with, they're quite close in, they're sort of up to sort of 20 miles offshore, whereas floating offshore wind farms um, in the Celtic Sea at least, um, and, and in Scotland, um, realistically, are likely to be sort of over 40, 50 miles offshore at least, which means um, they're going to be very difficult to see um, from the beach. So we've estimated that there's around 23,500 square kilometres of uh, sea area, which, um, which is suitable for um, offshore wind, floating offshore wind in the Celtic Sea. And these are the sea areas just off the coast of Cornwall. Interestingly, we've also worked out that if we were to put three gigawatts of offshore wind into those areas, it would take up no more than about three or 4% of that sea area. So we can see that there is a, a fantastic amount of resource out there, um, but we're not gonna need all of it. Um, but a small amount will go a very long way. So we can see that floating offshore wind as a credible solution for that green power transition as part of a global climate change mitigation is some way down the track of making a difference. It's estimated that by 2050, there will be 70 gigawatts of floating offshore wind installed. And that provides a massive opportunity for the businesses, the regions, the countries that get ahead of the game and learn how to industrialise this technology quickly. And that's really where we in Cornwall see our future. We're strategically incredibly well located for the Celtic Sea Basin. And along with our colleagues in Wales and Ireland, we are working really hard to understand the potential for this region. There's around 23,500 square kilometres of area, of resource area, uh, and the wind, some of the best wind resources in Europe can be found there. We need floating offshore wind to access it. And if we do that, we could actually meet at least, at least 70% of the UK's energy demand from this site alone. If we can do this first, if we can get ahead of the game, then we've got an opportunity to really support the global market in understanding how to produce low cost, low carbon offshore wind using floating offshore wind technology. This is a once in a generation opportunity to build a modern, green, innovative industry that is capable of driving this technology forward and making a significant impact in the global fight against climate change. 
Cornwall can be at the heart of this because we are strategically, fantastically located um, right at the heart of that Celtic Sea wind resource area. But we also have the history, the capability, the skills and the ambition to really take our place on the world stage. As space becomes more accessible to countries around the world, the data and space sector is growing. Companies such as Virgin Orbit, exploring horizontal launch, are working to make space more flexible and affordable. Spaceport Cornwall hopes to be one of the first operational spaceports hosting horizontal launch. Cornwall has ambitions of becoming a hub for data and space as we create an ecosystem of businesses enabling manufacture of satellites, getting them operational through Spaceport Cornwall and using businesses such as Goon Hilly to monitor the data. So together with our partners Flylogix, what we're looking to do is to use drones to deliver a service to the community. Uh, this would be an air freight service using drones to carry time-sensitive cargo uh, such as medical equipment, including medicines, uh, blood samples from the local hospital. This follows a successful trial last year where we flew medical equipment and products from the Isles of Scilly between uh, the UK mainland and the Isles of Scilly, which was uh, a first in the UK. What is also extremely important is to make sure that wherever possible we can reduce carbon emissions. Greenhill has been here since the 1960s and it picked up the first transatlantic TV pictures. But more recently, Greenhill Earth Station Limited acquired the site in uh, 2014 and we've been revamping it in, into the sort of new space era of exploration uh, and really looking at some of the new technology like uh, data services and AI and, and machine learning. So there's a big push now to go to the moon and use the moon as a stepping stone to go to Mars uh, and that's both taking robotic missions and humans back. It means that we'll be able to participate from Goonhilly here in, in Cornwall, but it also means we'll be able to expand the business internationally and we're now looking to set up offices around the world and antennas around the world so that from Goonhilly we can have a, a global enterprise. Spaceport Cornwall is a consortium. It's made up of Cornwall Council, Virgin Orbit and Goonhilly Air Station to provide the UK its first ever horizontal launch spaceport and that's going to be live from next year in early 2022. So Virgin Orbit are our small satellite launcher. It's basically a 747 that's been modified to carry a, a huge 70-foot rocket under one wing. And that uses our, our airport runway, all, you know, infrastructure we already have here to launch to lower Earth orbit and deliver some you know, critical satellite technology to space. What we're really excited about is the opportunity to grow a space cluster here in Cornwall based around launch technologies, satellite infrastructure, and environmental intelligence from space. So we're really excited to build a satellite integration facility right alongside the spaceport where satellites will come in to be integrated onto the launcher. Um, and with that brings all the skills and talent base that we need to really look at the R&D and innovation behind satellites, what they do, the applications, and what they can do to help benefit life on Earth. Hi, my name is Melissa Thorpe and I'm the head of Spaceport Cornwall here at Cornwall Airport Newquay in Cornwall. Welcome to G7, we're really excited to have you here. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the space sector in Cornwall. Um, we're at really exciting times here. So to put it all into perspective, space is changing. We have a world today that is hungry for space data and space technology. And what we're seeing now with the front page of every newspaper at the minute either being about Mars or the next launch coming up from SpaceX or Blue Origin or Virgin Orbit and Virgin Galactic is this huge appetite for space and a huge excitement for space. And what that's doing is leading this way to, to new business and new opportunities. And really what we are trying to do here in Cornwall is to capture some of that global excitement for the industry. The UK actually built a large majority of the world's small satellites here. And what we're starting to see from that is a desire to get them launched from the UK as well. And that's building an entire ecosystem around that. We have data companies, satellite application companies. We have 
upstream manufacturers of space um, widgets and gadgets that, that are needed to get these amazing technologies into space, all here in the UK. And actually, at the minute, the UK is contributing almost £360 billion a year to the GDP of the country. So what you're seeing is a huge market opportunity. The UK government have a desire to claim about 10% of the global marketplace in space. And so with that, they're trying to come up with different ideas and projects around the country to really capitalize on that. And one of the things that they have decided is they'd like to create a launch capability. As I said, small satellites are a major industry in the UK, but at the minute they're all being shipped overseas to launch. So what the UK government decided is they wanted to have a spaceport in the UK. Now, spaceports are popping up all around the world at the minute, commercial spaceports, because entrepreneurs like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and Richard Branson and other entrepreneurs are looking for better ways to access space. And they don't want to use the remote, hard to get to places that have launched rockets in the past. They want places that can really show off their technologies. So commercial spaceports are now starting to pop up all over the world. And what the UK government wants is that piece of the pie here in the UK. And Cornwall is actually one of those places. So we have Spaceport Cornwall in Cornwall due to launch next year with our partners at Virgin Orbit. And that is going to be incredible for the UK, incredible for the Southwest, and incredible for Cornwall. Because what it will do is create access to space. And what we can do with that access to space is to get incredible technologies to where it needs to be at lower cost, more reliable launch solutions, and a way that we can get that data back down in a more efficient manner. So we are really excited to work with our partners here, Goonhilly Earth Station, the Southwest Centre of Excellence for Satellite Applications, and all the amazing space companies in Cornwall. Cornwall actually has 55 space businesses already. That's grown 164% in the last decade, which is incredible. We're on the cusp of realizing a billion pounds of income to Cornwall from the space sector. And in somewhere that is beautiful as this that you may not ever think of when you think of space, what we're doing here now is about to change the way that the UK get to space. And what we're working with with our partners is how we do that more responsibly. So how can Cornwall really take a global lead in launching to space? Because pictures paint a thousand words. We've seen recently with the, the pandemic, images of places like Italy before and after lockdown from space. And these images showed the carbon emissions above Italy that you know nobody could argue that those pictures showed that they could have decreases of carbon from human activity being stopped. And what these, what these images did is actually led to policymakers making changes to their local industries. So for instance, Venice changed their tourism policies to look at how they could be more sustainable. So having those pictures and using satellites to create those pictures is incredible because what it does is actually go on to change the way that environmental policy is being written. It, they're unbiased imagery, they are almost real time, and they're clearer than ever before. But the irony is the way that those satellites are getting into space is actually still quite impactful to the environment. And what we would like to do here in Cornwall is ensure that the impact that we have on the local environment with our launches is as low as possible, is transparent, and then is backed up with a sustainability action plan that will go on to make us the most sustainable spaceport in the entire world and go out to challenge the rest of you the same. So while launch is really exciting, actually the real power horse here is data. Humans are hungry for data. We use it every single day from the moment we get up and look at our phones to getting on trains or planes, to driving and using GPS, to ordering prescriptions online, to healthcare industries, to agriculture rotating crops more efficiently. Data is everything today. And to get that data, we need to bring it back down to earth. And that's where Goon Hillier Station come in. They have an amazing, incredible green data center down at, at Goon Hilly. And they're also looking at communications and how they communicate out to those satellites. So at the minute they're doing deep space communications, they're world leading in deep space communications. They can communicate to the moon and even onto Mars now. And to have that asset here in Cornwall to, to, 
to capture that data means that we can then process that data in a way that's more efficient. So we're launching the satellites, we're then receiving the data back from those satellites into Cornwall, and we're working with academic partners to then start to translate that data into policy and into things that will really have an impact on making our world more sustainable and more efficient. So heavy polluting industries that are around Cornwall right now are using this data to become more efficient and to operate and take business opportunities out of space. So when we say there's 55 space companies in Cornwall, we mean companies that not necessarily are directly making products for space, but also using space to make their business more efficient. Whether that's creating applications for surfing and, and weather monitoring and wave height, or it might be looking at um, satellite data to identify the growth of refugee camps and working with the UN. These are the types of businesses we have in Cornwall right now. And we want to grow those businesses even more because that is where the benefit of something like a launch is going to start to spread throughout the Southwest. So space is really exciting and what we want to do is galvanize that excitement and use it to power inspiration for the next generation. We have an objective to actually reach out to every single school child in Cornwall to get them inspired about space, about careers in STEM, especially girls. We're working with projects like Tech Girls to get more girls into careers in STEM, breaking down stereotypes and barriers to industries like space. And what we want to do is actually raise aspirations here in Cornwall and across the UK to really get the next generation excited about an industry like space because we need them. So we're working with local colleges and universities to design courses and the skills that actually we will need to run the spaceport to run Goon Hilly in the future so that school children locally will be able to go straight into college and university and then come out the other side and come and work with one of the space companies here in Cornwall. So that's that end-to-end -end ecosystem of education and inspiration that we're really excited about. So Cornwall is bringing space back down to earth. We're going to be launching more responsibly and the products that we're going to be launching are going to go on to better our life and make it more efficient and more inspirational here on Earth. From improved and more accessible experiences to transformations within industry, digital and technology plays a key role in the green industrial revolution. Through Falmouth University, Cornwall's Creative Industry University, to the Universities of Exeter and Plymouth, tech and digital education is feeding us a pipeline of innovative and exciting businesses and young people with the skills to support our emerging sectors. So the Games Academy at Falmouth University was designed so that students got a really top-class education in, in game development. Cornwall has a history of both being an innovator in technology and in terms of art. And what I really love about games is that it brings technology and art together in a, in a really fascinating way. And that makes Cornwall a really great place to do game development. Launchpad is the only venture studio in the UK embedded with a world-class creative UK university. We're here to achieve global impact through, through sustainable innovative businesses. Um, that's a big step for Launchpad, but it's one that we know that we can do from Cornwall. There's great talent here, there's great resource within the programme, and we've got a great network of people on the programme helping our candidates get there. So we worked with the Eden Project and we were really fortunate to do so. So that was through our pilot with them via the Launchpad programme we provided a gamified interactive map that we had drawn as a company and then we actually sent personalised discounts. So that had the great benefit of taking away the crowd from the busy link building in the canteen and actually upselling to the Mediterranean restaurant. And we actually used the data afterwards to find that 33% of our surveyed users responded to monetary offers, which meant we had the power to shift a third of the visitor population on site, which is huge potential. Uh, so I think Cornwall's been a really supportive network for us, especially um, with the tourism industry being so large down here. Also with the tech sector, that's been a really supportive network, um, which means that we can actually use our GPS and downstream satellite technology. So agriculture has a part to play in combating climate change. In Cornwall and in the southwest of England, about 20% of our carbon footprint is associated with agriculture. We can monitor the inputs and the outputs associated with dairy. So we can have three different groups of dairy cows, we can feed them different rations and different supplements, and then we can monitor each cow and the yield of the cow in milk, 
the health of the cow, but we can also collect the slurry that each of these three groups of cows produces, and we can look at those as a source of fertilizer and to reduce and monitor the emissions that are associated with them and how we can use them for other things like producing biomethane. Diff Dar, Planedia Gonasgothef, Tamsin Smith, Ove. Hello, I'm Tamsin Smith and I'm the lead for culture at Cornwall Council. Cornwall's known for its heritage, its landscape, its beautiful beaches. We've got incredible mining history. Our um, innovation within mining was worldwide. You go to any mine in the globe and th there'll always be a Cornishman or a Cornish bit of equipment at the bottom of it because we were at the cutting edge of that innovation in in during that industrial age. We're also known for our incredible artists, Barbara Hepworth, the Newland School Painters, again, leading in a global world around that particular discipline in terms of our art and that international feel and international perspective of wanting to be on that stage. We're a peninsula, so we're always going to look out towards the globe or are surrounded by the sea. By our very nature, we're going to be looking out. And so this really sets us well in terms of a new narrative, being bold, being uh, more natural, I guess, and running with that innovation and heritage to drive our creative sector going forward. So the innovation's there, the heritage is there, the landscape is there. All of those things really push us forward and drive us forward in terms of driving our ideas, our problem solving, our ability, our natural ability to be collaborative. We also have that real nat natural ability in terms of our grit, our determination. We're pretty good at that self-deprecation as well. So there's always a bit of humour in there, which makes us fun to work with too. And I think that really puts us in a very strong place in terms of our, creativ our creativity, um, our creative ecology and our creative industries about really driving new areas in terms of that innovation and being pioneering as we have done previously in, with our heritage um, and the things that we're known about. So some of the things you might not know about us. We've got an incredible creative tech sector. Our gaming sector is uh, award winning. It's incredible. It's really pushing the boundaries in terms of using both our technical knowledge and our creativity. Our screen sector is going from strength to strength. Cornwall Council is really proud to have um, invested alongside the Cornwall and Isles of Scilly uh, Local Enterprise Partnership in setting up Screen Cornwall. It's now a couple of years old. We're really wanting to push that forward now in terms of setting up a growth fund so we can encourage national and international production companies to come here, base themselves in Cornwall and then use our incredible pool of talent both, both in terms of tech, ideas and creativity alongside our incredible landscape. The other thing we're really keen on doing is setting up a content fund. So that's about driving our, that heritage of Cornish storytelling, but bringing that to a modern uh, backdrop, I guess, and a modern context, um, and also making sure that we keep alive our Cornish language, our wonderful Kanoic. So one of the challenges we do face is the fact that some people think that creativity can only happen in urban or city settings. We just don't believe that's true. In fact, we know it's not true. Um, we've recently co-commissioned a bit of research with Falmouth University, one of the UK's leading art universities based right here in Cornwall. And through that um, initial uh, landscape scanning, really, uh, we found over 45 creative hubs across Cornwall. And that's absolutely reflective of how we are. We are a dispersed, networked, um, a, a well-connected, um, small scales so were mainly made up of freelancers and micro businesses but that gives us a bit of uh, flexibility and agileness of versatility to make things happen and we can do that really quickly and we can turn things around really quickly we bring mates on board we put a quick phone call in we get the right people together to make things happen and to do that at a world-class high quality level so one of our successes is that Mark Jenkins' uh, recent film, Bait, uh, won an award at the BAFTAs the year before last, and he's currently filming an, another shoot um, down here in Cornwall, again, drawing on our heritage to tell a story about uh, local communities, local challenges, but doing that at the cutting edge of filmmaking. It's a really exciting um, proposition and it's exciting stuff. So what we've done is we've made a step change in how we talk about our creative industries. We're not apologising for being small scale. We're not apologising to be made up of freelancers and we're not apologising about not having a hub. We are a dispersed rural creative economy. And at the beginning of this year, our new strategy went live, Cornwall's Creative Manifesto. 
And that vision, Cornwall is the UK's leading creative economy, is exactly what that strategy will see us through. We've got a plan for the next five years to really test that, to uh, celebrate it, to show it and to bring that to the world. And hopefully through the G7, this is a fantastic spring forward for us to be able to have that conversation, to engage with other rural communities um, across those nations and to really pack a punch, I guess, to say that creativity, innovation, ideas in terms of economic growth, social impact, cultural impact and environmental impact, we can give as much of a bigger punch as any city or urban region. So we can't wait to host the G7 Summit and to welcome you here to Cornwall. We hope you have a fantastic time and part of that fantastic time is about engaging and experiencing our culture and creativity. In terms of the film that's part of the G7 Kerno Cultural Programme, we hope that gives you a flavour of some of the aspects I've been talking about today. Our grit, our determination, our creativity, our ideas and above all our collaborative nature. We think this is something that we can really offer the world and we look forward to new opportunities and relationships that may come. Thank you very much for joining us for today's briefing. I hope you found it interesting ahead of coming to the G7. If you've got any questions flowing from this briefing or if you've got anything you want to ask in general, please get in touch with us.